Okay, welcome back. The next talk will be by Jan Knisja, Kiska, 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 on uh, getting more Debian into our civil infrastructure. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Yeah, so my name is Jan Kiska. Um, you may not know me. I'm not a Debian developer. I'm not a Debian maintainer. I'm just an upstream hacker. Um, I'm working for Siemens um, and uh, part of a, of a Linux team there for now 10 years, actually. Uh, more than 10 years. Uh, we are supporting our, our business units in, in getting Linux uh, into the products successfully for that long time, and even longer, actually. Uh, and today I'm representing a collaborative project that has some relationship with Debian, and even more soon, I'm pretty sure. So first of all, maybe a surprise to some of you, um, our civilization is heavily running on Linux. And you may now think about um, these kind of devices, uh, where some kind of Linux inside, or you may think of all the cloud servers running Linux inside. Uh, but actually, this is about devices um, more closer to us. In all of our infrastructure, um, there are control systems, there are management systems included. And, and many, many, many of them run Linux inside. So maybe if you are traveling with a Deutsche Bahn um, to this event uh, these days, um, there was some Linux system on the train as well, as there were on the wayside, so on the control side. Um, energy generation. So power plants, they are also run with Linux um, in very interesting ways and in positive ways. Um, industry automation, so the factories, they have control systems inside. And quite a few are running Linux inside. And also other systems like healthcare, diagnostic systems. So these big bows up there, the magnetic resonance uh, imaging systems, they're running on Linux for over a decade now. Building automation, so not uh, at home, but um, in the professional building area. Um, so actually, as I said, the train systems, they are going to be even more on Debian soon. Um, we have Debian for quite a while in power generation, so we, in this case, Siemens. Um, we have the box underneath on the third row, uh, the industrial switch there is running Debian. Um, and the healthcare device is still on Ubuntu, but soon will be Debian as well. Just to give some examples. and. These are the areas where we as a group and we as Siemens are active. But there are some problems with this. Just take an example um, from a railway systems. Usually these kind of devices, installations, they have a lifetime um, of well, 25, 50 years. Um, well, it used to be quite simple with these old devices, simple in the sense that it was mechanic was pretty robust and you can I was once told that one of these locking systems they were basically left in a booth in a box out there for 50 years and no one entered the box no one touched the whole thing for 50 years uh, these times a little bit over nowadays we have more electronic systems in these systems and they contain of course software and what does it mean just to give you an idea how these kind of development looks like in this domain so it starts that, well, development takes quite a long time um, until the product is ready, three to five years. Um, then in the railway domain, it's mostly about customizing the systems for specific installations. So the railway systems, not only in Europe, they are kind of messy regarding the differences. So you have specific requirements of the customer, means the railway operators, to adjust these systems for their needs. And you see by then, um, after five years already, uh, a Debian version would be out of maintenance. And if you add another year, well, you can start over again. Uh, so in the development time, you may change still the system. But later on, it's getting hard to change the system fundamentally, because then the interesting part starts in this domain, not only in this domain. That's um, safety and security uh, assessment and, and uh, approval for these systems. Um, and it also takes time. And so, for example, in Germany, you go for the Eisenbahn uh, Bundesamt and you ask to get the permission to run that train on the track. And if they say, oh, I'm not happy with it, um, you do it over again, um, and it takes time. And if you change something in the, in the system, it becomes interesting because then some of these certification aspects become invalid and you have to redo it. And then, of course, these trains and the installations, they have a long lifetime, as I mentioned before. So how do you deal with this in electronic devices and software-driven devices over this long phase? That's our challenge. 
And it's uh, just one example, and there are more in this area. At the same time, what we see now <laughs> is these uh, fancy buzzwords from uh, cloud business entering our conservative, slowly moving domain. And we talk about uh, IoT, uh, industrial IoT, so connected devices. We talk about edge computing, means getting the power of the cloud to the device in the field, closer to where the real thing happened. Um, so networking becomes a topic. So in the past, you basically built a system, you locked it up physically, um, you never touched it again, except the customer complained that there was some bug inside. These days, the customer asks us to uh, do a frequent update. And actually, not only the customers, also the regulatory bodies ask for this. So you have to have some security maintenance concept in this, which means regular updates, regular fixes. Um, and, and that is, of course, challenging for these kind of domain where you have a slow-running and long-running support cycles. So to summarize, there is a very long time we have to maintain our devices in the field. And so far, this was mostly done individually. So each company, and sometimes, and not that, sometimes quite frequently, also inside the company, each product group development corner did it individually. So everyone has having its own kernel, everyone has having its own base system. It was easy to build up, so it should be easy to maintain. Of course, it's not. Um, yeah, so this was one thing, or this is one important thing. And then, of course, we not always are completely happy with what the free software gives us. There are some needs well, to make things more robust, to make things more secure and reliable. Um, so we have to work with these components and, and improve them, mostly upstream. Um, and that, of course, is another challenge we have to address in this area and catch up with the trends that are coming in from the server space, from the cloud space. So with these challenge, um, oops, it was the point where, where we, in this case, uh, a number of, of uh, big users of industrial um, open source systems came together and created a new collaborative project, as you do in the open source area. And this project is called Civil Infrastructure Platform. Um, it's among the, or it's uh, under the uh, umbrella of the Linux Foundation. So there are many projects Linux Foundation you may have seen, but most of them are more in the area of cloud computing or in the area of maybe uh, automotive computing. This one actually is, is even more conservative than the other ones, and it's, uh, it's also comparably small. And our goal is to build this, um, yeah, this open source base layer for these application scenarios. Um, based on free software, based on, on Linux. We started um, now two years ago, and that's basically our structure, to give you an idea. So member companies, so the, the three on the top are uh, the founding platinum um, companies, Hitachi, Toshiba, and Siemens. Um, we have uh, CodeSync and, and Platform on board. We had them on board from the first time as well. And Renesas joined us, and just recently also Moxa. So if you compare this with other collaboration, collaborative projects, it's a pretty small one, comparatively small one, so our budget is also limited. It's still it's decent enough, but, um, well, we are growing. And based on this budget, we have some developers uh, being paid, so part of uh, Ben is paid this way. We will see later on why. Um, and we have um, people working from the companies in the communities, and we are ramping up on, on working with communities, um, yeah, to improve um, the base layers for our needs. Everything is open source. Um, we have a GitLab repo as well, and you can look up there what's going on there. So the main areas of activities where we are working on right now. So four areas, um, kernel maintenance. Um, so we uh, started with uh, declaring one kernel as the CIP kernel to have uh, an extended uh, support phase for this kernel of, of 10 years. So this is what we are aiming for, um, which is feasible already for some enterprise distros in a specific area. But here we are talking about an industrial area, an embedded area. So there is some, some challenge. Um, well, I'm saying 10 years. They are sometimes written 15 years. Um, we will see after 10 years if we prolong to this. Um, along with this, of course, comes the need for, for real-time support. So we are also, uh, currently it's a separate branch, but it's going to be integrated eventually, have a prem.t uh, branch, colleague of mine is doing this. 
And as I mentioned before, um, Ben is currently our 4.4 um, CIP kernel maintainer. Um, so yeah, this is the core basically where we started activities. Uh, we continued in extending this on, on test infrastructure, so we invested a bit um, in um, improving on, on Lava infrastructure. We are now ramping up an internal uh, Lava lab um, just to enable the kernel testing, of course. And then, and that's actually what I'm, I'm going to talk about today a bit more. Um, there's a CIP core, so the kernel alone doesn't make a system, so you need a user space, um, you need a user land. And, and that's basically um, where we are now focusing on, or we are now ramping up. Uh, our activities is to define this CIP core, means a base system, user space base system, which we want to maintain as long as the kernel. So another 10 years thing. So, and our group um, had a couple of members which were already uh, familiar with Debian before. Um, and so it was pretty easy for that group to decide on choosing Debian as the base, as the base source for our core uh, CIP core package, or package set. So why was Debian chosen? Um, well, it has an outstanding maturity um, and, and focus on stability, so we are pretty much aligned regarding how conservative we see certain things, uh, which is a positive thing for us. Um, it has very professional security uh, properties um, that we also rely on heavily. And also another interesting aspect for us is um, the license hygiene that you are after uh, to ensure that there is uh, yeah, only free software in these packages and that is properly documented. Um, um, we, when we are using and redistributing software, well, in contrast to, for example, the, uh, the server space where you don't usually redistribute things, uh, we are redistributing devices, so we are redistributing software. We have to take care of the licenses that we are redistributing and that we are compliant uh, with all these licenses included. So it's very important for us that this is a consistent picture we get from the package. Someone took look, a look at this already. Um, we are still looking ourselves on this, but um, that's a very important thing. So with these characters, we chose Debian as the base system. Um, so what does it mean right now? Uh, we are currently in, this, in the process, as I said, to select the core packages from the Debian packages. Um, there is to be some little bit of strip down, obviously. Um, so we are already working with Debian on certain long-term support aspects. Uh, just to mention two activities, so we were sponsoring already the, the staging repo for Security Master. Actually, I'm personally not aware of the current status of this project, but um, uh, we got the feedback that it's apparently a, a valuable thing for LTS activity. Uh, we just joined LTS uh, project Platinum sponsoring, and we are now involved in the discussion to for this extended LTS activities, so anything beyond five years. Um, and well, in the end, that's what we committed to our users. Um, we want to ensure that for the base system, the 10 years is reached. Of course, ideally in the community, uh, not only based on our own personal activities, but in the end, uh, we have to, uh, to fill the gap and that's basically our commitment on this. Uh, don't take this literally, what is written here. So this is basically to reflect the, the package set we are discussing. And there are, well, there are some 30 to 300 packages under discussion, so to say, right now. Um, which is, uh, we are condensing basically the input from our users, from our members, what they are using already. And there's a difference, we will see later on uh, where these comes from, in the amount of packages and the way they are using. So the kernel currently is um, not part of the Debian thing we import although some of our users will directly use a Debian kernel. Um, but as I said, when there is a need for additional activities, um, that's where our CIP kernel comes in. Um, and then we have a set of base packages. And then, of course, we also have to have a certain set of packages that we need to keep uh, in a usable way to ensure the reproducibility of this base set. Because if we want to fix something after nine years in the field on a base system produced in the past, we have to ensure that we can come up with the same result plus the delta. So there are different ways how to build a system um, and compared to the classic installation you may know from a desktop on a server, you're not installing. We are pre-building images and then deploy these images on the devices, either in the factory or out there in the field. So the challenge for us is um, if we have these package lists, how to get to the, to the device image. So just to give you a brief idea, so of course there is um, some input from um, the CIP kernel in source form. Um, then we are using predominantly uh, pre-built binary packages from Debian. 
and or source package or the source feed from Debian. So the, the Debian source, uh, the upstream source plus the Debian patches as input feed and that comes down to a minimum base system um, to be generated and we are currently working on this. Um, there is no defined way of producing this image within CIP at this point. We are basically following two paths. One of them is the path which is uh, dominated by the idea, okay, we have to ensure, we in this case, uh, the corporate environments have to ensure to reproduce the image ourselves, the binaries ourselves. So we take the um, maintained sources from the Debian community, uh, but we rebuild and then generate a new binary, so to say, out of these. That's one way, and that's an activity which if you heard about it, Meta Debian, a uh, project prominently, uh, pr predominantly uh, driven by Toshiba, uh, which uses um, uh, the Yocto-like, Bitbag-like way of producing a base system, but out of Debian sources, so that you have a maintained um, yeah, source input feed for this production. That's one path. Um, the other path is uh, using predominantly binary packages and Personally, and specifically also at Siemens, we are more following this path here. Um, so there is, for example, the ESA project. Uh, Bajan is one of the developers here um, as well. Um, we are working on this path. Um, means that um, 95 or 99 percent of your image consists originally of binaries, Debian binaries, as they are shipped, as they are released. And then there is uh, often the need to modify a little bit, maybe the kernel, maybe the bootloader, maybe a special patched package for whatever reason, hopefully good ones. Um, you have an infrastructure to, to assemble the binary images and to produce the source packages on demand and install that into an image that you then can flash on the device. That's the second path we are following. Um, as I said, that's just to describe the workflows. Um, the technology behind it is not yet standardized in the CIP. Um, for us at Siemens, currently the, the main strategy, as I said, is the ESA pass. So it's also bitbake based Yocto-like production, but based on the Debian binaries, producing a ready-to-install um, yeah, device image. So if we look at the situation, um, so what is Debian providing? Well, a large set of packages a nice level of support, three plus two years LTS mostly. Um, that's already great. I mean, there's everything available, almost everything in the world with for free software we can get via Debian. Um, the build, um, well, it support native build. That's um, also advantage because, well, fighting after uh, 10 years, 15 years with cross build, there is always a problem with cross building, um, even a little bit. So this is a, a good strategy to go to go, although you're also working on cross builds that may be interesting for certain scenarios as well for us. And we're all discussing this these days, reproducible build is also very important for us um, because we also have to prove that the delta is really only on the delta that has to be changed and not anything else. And we have to rebuild something for whatever reason, we don't want to produce a completely different image in the end. So it's a very important topic. I mentioned already before the license compliance topics. Um, I'm not really the, the deep expert in all the licensing thing, except when I have to be, because some customer asks us internally how to be compliant and how to solve certain compliance findings. Um, a colleague of mine, my colleague, for example, who's maintaining the Phosology project, is way more in this, uh, because we have our also infrastructure to ensure license compliance um, and, and identify packages, package ideas, and the idea uh, to, as far as I heard, is that to combine these kind of activities so that uh, Debian can also use the information that these kind of scanners produce, like SPDX formats, and, and uh, build it into the Debian uh, 5 next generation. And, and in turn, we can extract these information and ensure that they are still valid when we, when we take a package. So there's a lot of activity already great in this area. Um, and of course, testing not to mention. So what we need to require here, as I said, one thing is, well, we need a longer support phase. Um, the number of packages, fortunately, is then much lower. So, um, yeah, as I said, so something like a couple of hundreds at most is uh, what we are currently heading for, for most of our devices. Um, 
we have the need to both build natively and cross-build, cross-build pyramidal NP in the development phase, uh, but there might be also cases where it might be useful for a production image. But predominantly, it's for the development phase. You want a quick turnaround time when you're building on XD6 for ARM, for example. Um, yeah, the binary source packages should be managed and, and reproducible. The license compliance already mentioned. Um, and yeah, the testing activity is also something that we want to improve on further. So where we see the collaboration, um, yeah, already mentioned longer term maintenance um, for packages. Um, that's definitely an area where we, we are reaching out and we are already in discussion. Um, contributing to Debian Cross, there's activities um, going on this area. Uh, reproducible build, we had some discussion, Holger and, and uh, Chris, these days, uh, where we could possibly support you on this. It's not our topmost priority at this point, but it's obvious that it will become uh, <laughs> in the future. Um, and also a way, possibly interesting for you, I think there is a good chance that these activities also open up more uh, adoption in the embedded space of Debian. So because we are also discussing these kind of things with our suppliers, means the silicon vendors, pushing them to be more upstream in order to have it easier for us to integrate their work in our systems. Um, and eventually also enabling them to, well, use the same mechanism that we are using for building our images to build their, our customer um, SDKs or however they call them. Um, and that can create a larger ecosystem. And we have been discussing already with some of these vendors and some of them actually are interested in, in Debian as well as a, as a default image to replace those not so successful um, source build approaches that are out there in the field. Um, eventually with something hmm, more easy to use. Um, the another area I really like to see that we uh, have collaboration on is the regarding the license results. So we at Siemens currently are running through with this subset package set through a uh, uh, Sology run. And I would like to see the result of this run, comparing it to what Debian is currently reporting in the metadata, if there is any gaps, anything that our experts say, OK, you should uh, documented more in that way or there is something missing and of course report these issues upstream because eventually I don't want to rescan every single security update package internally again if you did it already. Um, that should just run through and we should have the trust that this information is accurate and, and we can rely on them. That's the vision behind it. And yeah, test cases would be also an area where we see um, the chance to contribute something. Further things we are discussing might be not that interesting for Debian, but it's interesting in general, functional safety activities. You will be surprised how many people are asking for functional safe Linux these days. May it be for automotive, but also for industrial purposes. Um, worth mentioning actually is the security standard this way. Um, so even if you're not involved in all this IC, whatever stuff, it's interesting because this is pushing us in industry to do things like update strategies even more um, consistently and ensuring that the image that we ship is integer. So that is really the original image, um, up to the questions uh, how to secure the boot and, and how to secure this, uh, the system is running. Um, so that helps us to argue internally and externally for consolidation. And that helps us currently to push a lot of these users um, towards the Debian solution. So one of our units did once a survey, recently actually, about how many Linux systems they have out there and they counted 99 balloons, um, Linux systems, actually. Um, and of course, you can imagine it's pretty hard to maintain 99 variants in the field out there. So they are one of the most prominent drivers uh, inside our company to consolidate the systems. And we are currently consolidating over Debian. Not everything, but most of it. Yeah, and then there is this doomsday date as well, uh, which is creating, uh, creating an increasing concern, because you can imagine that if you are building a device today, um, maybe it's out of business in 10 years. OK, you are lucky. Maybe it's still running in 20 years and is not yet ready for 2038. And then we have a problem. So that's things that are going on currently already. Um, so one of our units, for example, is sponsoring activities in GLIPC um, to prove the topic. And as a consortium, as a CIP group, we are also looking into this. We will not jump in on things which are already been happening. But if there are gaps up there, then we will possibly jump in here as well. So to summarize, we believe 
I personally as well, is very strong that our infrastructure, our system infrastructure is, is way too critical to run arbitrary software on it, um, which is happening, not everywhere, fortunately, and we can improve on this together because um, there's a strong interest in our group to enable and preserve an open source base layer for this environment. Um, we chose Debian uh, as a solid foundation because we believe that this is technically a good solution and it's also a good solution because it's a community approach that we are also following. We see that we don't differentiate um, over these base layer. We differentiate between our competitors on the higher functionality, on the integration, but not what is in details running underneath. And this is a very great point to uh, collaborate and to work together. Um, and CRP is really looking forward to deepen the support um, of and the collaboration with Debian community. Um, so if you have any ideas or if you have any suggestions uh, how we should approach certain things, what we should also think about, uh, feel free to approach me, feel free to approach the community. Um, there are some resources. I think I put it somewhere here. No, it's gone, unfortunately. Um, there's a mailing list we have. Um, it's currently dominated by, by kernel patch reviews, the backports that we are doing for the Fallout 4 kernel, but there are also other toys being discussed. So this is uh, one of the channels. We have our GitLabs. Um, yeah, and we are persons around um, meeting us maybe once in a while on some conference or whatever. Feel free to approach us and talk to us. would be very much appreciated. And with this, now, thank you, and I'm taking questions. Thanks, Jan, for the talk. Are there questions? The video team. <laughs> one, one question you said you have like 100 Drift and uh, Linux uh, variations. Do you plan to replace them? With Debian, or is is the plan only for the new devices you you chip to yeah. use Debian? So unless you are really forced to, for whatever reason, you usually do not replace sim something which has been deployed to the field. Um, that usually causes more churn than to keep with it and and bite in the dust and try to prolong the support. Um, so this is more about the new things coming up. Um, it's a step moving forward. So currently we're discussing maybe a, a handful of, in this specific domain where this 99 variants come from, a handful of, of applications ranging from virtual machine images um, on, on embedded servers to the embedded servers themselves. And the smallest thing I currently am working on is a, is a box for um, being a data diode. So it's a device which ensures that the critical network is not infiltrated from the outside physically, but it still enables certain kind of logging functionality for this thing. So these are the range that we are currently dealing with in that domain only. Um, and there's more coming, uh, including hopefully, at least for our company, even for some of our platforms, which are open platforms, means you get a hardware and you get a software stack on top, which might be Windows or it might be Linux, um, and that Linux might be Debian, most probably. Thank you for this really insightful talk. I'm totally excited about uh, such big companies putting some pressure behind Linux and Debian and the free software in general in industrial applications. And I remember my heart jumping when I saw a Debian spill two, two weeks ago on one of those info displays in the S-Bahn bringing me home from work. <laughs> um, actually, even if that device was malfunctioning, mm, okay. but it was <laughs> <laughs> displaying a Debian spill it's at last. It's more friendly than the blue screen, um, yes. <laughs> my question is, yeah. um, what is your vision about the SSL situation in, the, in this very long-term maintenance? I mean, we still have the vast majority of software using OpenSSL with its problematic license, and we have a gazillion of alternatives where are things going on the SSL side of industrial applications? That's a very good question. Uh, I don't have a definitive answer to this as well. Um, so currently, um, there is quite a bit of open SSL being deployed. Um, it, it's not really new. It has happened, I think, for 10 years already. Um, and that's the state of the art, so to say, with all the pros and cons involved. Uh, we are a little bit involved in, in, in working certain with certain features in upstream, but in the end, um, it's, a, it's a question we will have to see. Um, hopefully these libraries become more compatible, so eventually you may be able to even replace certain aspects of them in the field. 
Uh, but if all goes wrong, we really have to invest also in the maintenance of these things. Um, so, well, we are currently also uh, facing this with the distributions, so hopefully the distributions will work on this as well, and where there is a need, we can collaborate on it. Um, technically, I would say it would be great to have something clean, shiny, and targeted, uh, but then again, it's a pretty hard challenge to solve this um, and to work on this. Uh, so I don't think that the major push will come from industry at this point. Our domain is still rather small compared to others. Um, but if we can individually support something without having to initiative, have, uh, have the initiative for to write a call thing or go the different way, um, that would be great, yeah. As I said, I don't have a definitive answer on this right now. Nice. There was a question over there. So my question is a little bit of licensing. Um, uh, GPL3 is mostly a concern in the industry. What is the policy or how is CIP handling this li uh, special license? So we don't have a definitive license exclusion list, except it has to be um, free software. Um, we have a preferred license for our own activities, actually, which is a permissive license. Uh, but we also do GPL licensing in our group. Um, but then the question is, what do we include in our package set, which is already there? So just these days, I had a discussion with um, an internal user uh, who came around with, ah, oh, these GPLv3, this evil stuff. Um, and I said, because in the context of we want to ensure that our device is really or original, so we have to lock down, we have to um, encrypt it, and we have to um, yeah, do this secure boot thing. I said, okay. Yes, the license says explicitly that there is uh, the need to unencrypt the device. And that has, of course, complications when you think about the liability that we have for our devices. So we run through all the certification processes, and we stand for that. And then now the someone changes this, um, how can we prove that it has been changed? Um, so they were, they were very concerned about GPLv3. Um, and I said, OK, it might be more explicit than the license, but GPLv2 had the same idea. And uh, you are at least in the in a gray area as well in this license, if you think about locking things down. Uh, fortunately, there are patterns. If they will work, something we have to see, um, that you can enable an end customer to replace the software, be compliant with the license, but of course then avoid your warranty, warranty on the device and on all these uh, yeah, legal obligations that we fulfill in this. Hopefully, this pattern it will work. Uh, if it doesn't work, but we are not alone with this problem, um, by far, uh, but we are very accurate in this. That can be sure. Mm -hmm. So if we do this, we do it mm -hmm. accurately. Yeah. Uh, the concern I hear often is also with functional safety in that concern. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, how, how to handle that? <laughs> so I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> I can answer this uh, definitely, um, but I think the discussion I had a couple of days ago triggered some ideas, and there was la one lawyer on the table as well. So the, the, the units are thinking about these patterns and if they can evolve a legal construct from this idea, okay, enabling the end user, whoever has the device, to replace the software and install their own thing without uh, granting the same liability on the outcome of this thing. We will see. So I'm really interested in that outcome. So best luck for that. Any further questions? I just wanted to add uh, two small notes. Um, you mentioned voiding of warranty if the user changes the uh, firm. We need to be careful with that because that's actually not legal in the EU. You cannot void warranty exclusively because the user has changed the software. You have to prove that the change of the software yeah. uh, made something wrong with the device, basically. So, um, and um, another note. Um, at, uh, at Collaborate, we develop a few tools which you may or may not find useful for Debian derivatives, for like creating uh, images, for example. Mm. It's called DebOS. So I, I, I see you use a slightly different workflow than we do because we have an OBS which builds the binary packages out of the Debian sources, and then we like use the apt feeds and we build images out of that. But still, you may find the uh, the the tool useful. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely look into what Debian tools being used in the community. We don't try to devoid, uh, deviate from this wherever possible. But yeah, there are some special requirements that we are dealing with um, that sometimes make it easier um, in the other way. Yeah. 
Any further questions? If not, then let's thank Anne again. <laughs>